Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Manscaped has the revolutionary electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it's guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts or your chest because you can use it upstairs and downstairs. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am very excited. I have a very elusive guest here today who I've been trying to get on the show probably since the beginning of my show, which was almost, if not exactly three years ago, which is kind of crazy. I'm talking about the one and only Kieran Lee, the man whose penis is insured for a million dollars the contract star of browsers and the all around best anal male performer. <laughs> I put, said that wrong, <laughs> meaning not that he takes it up the butt, but every girl has told me that you are the best guy to do their first anal scene with. The full How's school. that for an introduction? <laughs> what an introduction. I can't get better than that, can I? <laughs> yeah, so actually, uh why is why is it so wonderful to have anal sex with you? Why is every um, girl why are you like their favorite? Uh just, you know, my good looks, charm and every no, I think it's just the foreskin and that's it. I'm dead easy to work with. I just lie there and go, go on then, <laughs> stick it in and just don't move. <laughs> Let her nice and be relaxed and then just build it up and then that's it go with the flow. You are also well known to be like the one guy who can literally get through any scene. I don't think I've ever heard of an instance of you failing. You've been in the industry for like 20 over 20 years. So, um, you've probably had rougher days than others, but like, how do you maintain such an incredible consistency? Um, I always go to like a happy place. So, you know, no matter what the day is, whoever it is, I just kind of focus on one point of the girl or, you know, even play things back in my head and that's it, get in my zone. And so I can be laughy, jokey all the way through. Um, but when it comes to, you know, doing the deed, I just have to really get into my zone and focus. And, and then that's that. How... So you've been, like I just mentioned, you've been in this industry for a really long time. Have you found that it's easier or is it getting harder? Like, because have you become jaded? Like how, how is it now for you compared to when you first started? It's, it's a real weird mixture now. It's, I would say it's easier because I know myself as a performer. Um, before I used to really just be all about opening up to the camera, crazy positions and things like that, where now I kind of want to make the scenes more fun, more energetic, more passionate. Um, but yeah, I could say it's a little jaded now. It's, it's definitely changed a lot in the last 10 to 15 years, for sure. Um, I don't know. The big, I think the big difference for me now, I notice, is the the girls are kind of appearance I, I would say you know some girls might take offense to this but 10 years ago I don't know I, I just felt like the girls were really into all right I'm doing my hair I'm doing my nails I'm having my tan done I'm really prim and proper where sometimes now I just feel I, maybe it's just more so being a producer now that I notice girls just rock up last night's makeup still on you know wardrobe has been in there for like a week and, and things like that. And I think, ah, and then I look back at, you know, the days when I first came to America and girls were pristine and, and things like that. Do you think that it has anything to do with the fact that there's more girls in the industry now? And are you working with like more new girls now than you were? Were you working with like a smaller group of kind of the same girls before? Because I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, see, for me, I've always been working kind of with the same kind of pool. Because obviously being contract with Brazzers for so long, they kind of only use certain girls for the site. So it's kind of, you know, like 
God knows how many times I've worked with Phoenix Marine, Madison Ivy, um, these kind of girls. I've, I've worked with them loads. We know they sell on browsers, so I work with them repeatedly. But, you know, some of the newer girls, yeah, that, it's, it's a flash in the pan, you know. Yeah. I, I might work with them once and then that's it. I don't know how long they're going to be in the industry. You know, yeah. a lot of the newer girls seem to dip in and out um, quite quickly at the moment, I find. Do you find do you find that you can kind of tell whether or not they're going to stay yeah. from your first scene with them? Yeah, you can kind of tell. You can you can tell a girl that's got her head screwed on from the get go. Uh, you can tell also by what agency she's with. Yeah, know, that's a big one for me. I, I know if a girl's coming in and she's signed with Spiegler, then I know that she's going to be around for a good couple of years. Where if she's a girl that comes in with I won't say other agents, but at certain agents I'll go, I'm probably only going to work with you once and and that's it. You know, she's clearly just doing it for a one-off paycheck and, and she's out. Yeah. She's so for those out. who don't really, I've talked about Spiegler so many times on this podcast, but, you know, I've always got new listeners coming in. So for those of you who don't know Spiegler and know his story, he's probably the best agent in our industry and he's very serious about the girls that he takes on. He vets them. Um, he only takes on girls that he feels are really professional, really want to do this and have like a really clear sense of what they want. So when we say like Spiegler girls are the best, it's because he's so picky about who he represents and he only reps like 25 girls at a time. And it's kind of a, um, it's really like a, like an achievement to be a Spiegler girl. It's almost like a title. It's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's huge. You know, look at the amount of girls that he rejects that are established girls that have been in the industry mm-hmm. for maybe a year or two and never get the chance to join. I look at, I think a good example would be Anna Fox. Yeah. I remember Anna Fox being around for a good couple of years and it's only in the last, what is it, year or so that she's joined Spiegler and she, she built up a great name before only now she's only just been given the opportunity to, you know, join his agency. But not only that, he gives the girls a lot of good advice. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at, um, I think his probably shining example would be Jessie Andrews. She's come into porn. She made a lot of money off porn, but she's invested it. And now look, she's, she's flying. She's doing really well for herself. You know, yeah, she's yeah. got like a she's a great example of crossing over into mainstream. She's got like a jewelry company. She's doing tons of mainstream stuff. She's an established, really well respected businesswoman. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's let's go back a little bit. You've been in the industry for a while. Like I said, mm-hmm. I don't know why I keep saying that. Like I, it's like I want the world to know. It's my that grow. You're old. Just, yeah, just look at it. It's like, but it looks good on me. I like the gray. Uh, you know, men get better as they get older. They really do. The silver fox thing is working for you. I think George Clooney of porn now, aren't I? You aren't you? And look, I've even got new hair. I know. So your hair journey has actually been something that I've been following. You got what did you get done to your hair again? I had FUE. So. My, it wasn't bad. I just noticed it was starting to go thinner. And yeah. A friend of mine, he's a, he's in the mainstream industry over here, and he kept on giving me a load of abuse, going, oh, look at your hair. It's going thinner now. Because I've always been known for doing my hair. I love doing my hair. Mm-hmm. And uh, I started thinking, yeah, yeah, all right, whatever. And then, you know, I'm in the shower. You come out and you've washed, and you're like, oh, hang on, I've a few loose hairs there. And then... I noticed like certain styles that you do it it'd not look as good and you're brushing it down on one side and then changing it. And so I followed a clinic in London, uh, get more hair and followed them guys. And they hit me up and said, look, we, we would love to do the treatment for free for you. I was like, All right, brilliant. And, and that was it. Flew to England, made a bit of a mistake. Um, didn't realize the procedure was going to be in Turkey. Um, so, yeah, that was a little bit of a mistake. And then the problem is I'd watch, like, my wife, she likes to watch all these crazy shows, you know, like botched operations and things oh, like no. that. And we'd seen loads in Turkey, and I'm thinking, what have I done? <laughs> um, but, yeah, I went out there, and the clinic blew everything away that I've ever been to out here. 
So it was great. And so, yeah, they took the hair from the back of my head and then implanted it into the front. And yeah, this is a year on. So is it plugs or is it not plugs? I don't know a lot about men's it's, hair. It's my, it's my own hair. Uh huh. So they just basically, they shave my head and they, um, they basically pluck out the hairs from the root um, from there and then just implant it in and create a new hairline and fill all the density there. So it just gives it that full look again. And then the follicles continue to yeah. produce. Yeah, because the, the, the follicles that they take out, have you, have you ever noticed on any bold guy, that you see, like Johnny Sins, for example, would be a yeah. good example. If you noticed, he has the hair still yeah. running, completely gone. Up. That will never go on any guy. Yeah. It will never go. The follicles are so strong. So you can take them out and then replace it. And so that's oh, what wow. It, so, it does yeah, look it amazing. Nine hours or something like that. So yeah, it, was, it was well worth it. And then about 10 days off, and then I just had a shaved head and that was it. But yeah, now um, I know Ricky Johnson's just gone out. He's just had his done at the same clinic. Uh, Wolf Hudson is going out. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I think Danny D's on about going. So a lot of the people are now trendsetter, aren't I? I'm a shepherd, not a sheep. Well, this is why they offered you the treatment for free because they knew that you'd be open to talk about it. Because, you know, I think that men especially are wary to do any kind of cosmetic procedure to, because, you know, you'd never want to be perceived as vain or, you know, you're going to be a man and, like, who cares what you look like. But you've always been very open about it. So I think – people see the results and they're like, that looks amazing. Cause we're all insecure about, you know, yeah, every, everything. Everybody has insecurities. Like for me, you know, Botox, like people laugh. I love a bit of Botox. Do you know what <laughs> I mean? I've got no problem, no shame in having a bit of Botox. Like, look, if it's good enough for women, why is it not good enough for men? I agree. I think that you are the spokesperson for the modern man. Yeah. You can do whatever yeah. makes you feel good very metrosexual like look i have to introduce my wife to getting her eyebrows threaded for example so you know i get i get them threaded um i'll give her a do she did get me on the old botox she, yeah you could do with a little bit here and then next thing you know i had botox a bit of filler um but yeah i just, look it's no different really you think um for women look if you don't like your boobs you get a boob job you don't like your bum you get a brazilian booklet look for guys if you know, there's a lot of things that they don't like, um, you know, and especially I think for your hair for a guy is a, it's a huge thing. As soon as you start losing your hair, it's like, right, okay, may as well just shave it off, grow a beard. Right. Um, and then it's kind of like, a, you know, right, sod it, I may as well embrace the dad bod, I may as well do it. So, ne you know, for me, I was like, well, no, I love doing my hair. You know, when I do get dressed up and to go out, I like to, to look the part. I like to wear nice clothes and I like to look good, not just for me, but, you know, for my wife and, and things like that. So, yeah, I was like, sod it, why not? And, yeah, it, it gave you a, a real boost of confidence as well. You're also, I mean, you make, let's be honest, you make your living in front of the camera. So these yeah. things are important to you in a way for your career that they may not be so much for a yeah. bank. For me, again, it's more of a mental thing. Um, I've never been that male performer that's been ripped and in fantastic shape. I've always just been, you know, the guy next door. Listen, I'm the guy that will like a, a beer and a kebab and a curry. No problem. I go up and down with my weight, left, right, centre. And for me, that's never really been the, the main issue. But, you know... I think just mainly it was my hair though. That was a big thing for me because that's the thing that I see. I'd look at like certain angles. I'd be like, oh my God, it's bold in really. Like I might be about 20 pounds overweight, but I'll, all I'll see is look at my hair. <laughs> the right mess. But. I know exactly how you feel. So we got kind of off track, but I was going to ask you how you got into the adult industry. Oh, long, long story. So basically... I went out on um, vacation with all my friends, went on a, a boy's holiday, got really drunk, ended up like having a one night stand. And my friends took a picture of me after the incident and I'm hands up in the air, bollock naked, and they're laughing. Next thing you know, they, they put it on a swingers website. And 
All just to just to fuck with you. Yeah, just you know, at the time I was like seventeen and nearly eighteen, and I'm like, hang on. All of a sudden, I'm getting all these emails um, from couples saying, "Oh, we'd, you know, we'd love for you to come back." And I'm going, um, I don't even know what swinging is. This is a bit weird, but whatever. And then a couple from Loughborough hit me up, said, "Look, we're starting an amateur porn company. I'd love for you to do a scene with my wife." And I've gone, yeah, this looks a bit too good to be true. And, and you're going back, like, this is a long, long time ago. Like, you're having to literally dial up, download the um, the attachment, and all of a sudden this picture pops up. I'm like, wow, she she's really beautiful. But I still thought it was a hoax. So I was like, whatever. I said, look, meet me here at this time, and I'll be there. Didn't think anything of it, but I thought, you know, curiosity anyway. I've decided to go for a run. So I've chucked some sweatpants on, gone running, gone to this place, and, and there they are. And I'm thinking, holy shit, I've kind of got to do this now, haven't I? And uh, we ended up going to like a like a car park thing, and I said, what do I do? He goes, can you get your dick card? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. And and that was it. And I did the scene, and he goes, oh, this is amazing. Uh, like, just, you know, come whenever you can. And I'm like tell me when and I'll come. And he was like, what? So I literally count down, bosh, done. He's like, oh, can you come back next week? And, you know, we've got all these other people that are shooting, like couples we'd love for you to shoot with us. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, great. And um, so that was it. I just started going over to Loughborough and just working for this amateur company. And I was still working full-time in the railway. And... I had a really good job in the railway. I was a a production kind of uh, project manager for the railway. So I was in charge of like station refurbishments, electrical maintenance, things like that. So it was a really good job. Um, But not a lot of people know that I kind of got the job through my, my father's surname. That was it. And I don't, I don't speak to my dad. I've not spoke to my dad in, what, 20 odd years, 20, no more, 20, 25 years, something like that. And so whenever I was at the railway, he's, he's like a big wig at the railway. He's like a health and safety director for the whole railway. And whenever I did anything, it was always, Oh, Steve's lad, Steve's lad. And it used to really get me. And I was like, look, I want to be my own person. I hate living in his shadow and this, you know, they kind of gave me this little opportunity and then all of a sudden they got bigger, the the company, um, and they went on to be a company called Kilogram and they offered me a contract and I was like, yeah, I want to out of the railway. I want to kind of forget that name and that is it. And so I went to join them full time and I was with them for four and a bit years, I think, um, doing two scenes a day, Monday to Friday. Um, so literally 40 scenes a month. Wow. Uh, a hell of a lot. And I kind of made a good name for myself, you know, all because I was working with a lot of the UK girls. I don't know, like, if you can remember the girls, like Alicia Rhodes, um, Angel Long, Michelle. I remember B. Angel Long, yeah. Yeah, Michelle B. Um, yes. Knight, her. She all, was great. All, yeah, all these girls. So I was working with all these girls, and they're going, wow, you you're a really good performer. You should work for other companies. And I was like, in the end, I kind of got, you know, a little bored of just going to the same place every day, working on the same sofa and that. So I I went, right, I'm going to go freelance. And if anything, that was a nightmare because all of a sudden I was the new kid on the block. um, And that was it. People were going, oh, we want to, can you come here to shoot? Can you come here to shoot? And I'm, I'm in Nottingham, I'm in Bristol, I'm in London, I'm in Glasgow. I'm all over the UK shooting. Then I started making a name, obviously, all over the UK. And then all of a sudden, Europe came knocking. And that's when I went and shot for the likes of Christoph Clark and Rocco Sofredi uh, and Private and all them guys. And and that was that, really. And, uh, yeah, I made a good old name for myself in, in Europe. And then how did you get picked up by browsers? Well... So there was a girl back in the day called Lachelle Marie. I don't know if you can remember Mm. Lachelle Marie. There was a girl. There was Lachelle Marie, um, Carmela Bing, Brianna Love. 
uh, and all these girls, and they came over to the UK, and I, I, I worked with them in the UK for a company called Bluebird. And, oh uh, God! Yeah, so <laughs> with that guy, Paul was the guy who owned it, right? Yeah, yeah, he was interesting. So for years, he he was kind of get me to contract to them, but I never did. And I I can remember working for Bluebird, and I would be maybe doing three scenes a day. Like, yeah, you know, and the scenes were crazy. It was you know ten people in a scene, every single scene. It was just nuts. Um, but how I came about coming over to America is uh, I became good friends with Danny Mountain and he was dating Ever Angelina at the time and he was getting married and he said, look, come over to America. I want you to come to my wedding. And I was like, you know what? I've just done, I think that month I'd done 44 scenes that month. I was complete, I was wrecked. I was tired. I was all over, I was in Prague and Budapest up. A lot. And so I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to come out for two weeks, three weeks. So I flew out, went to the wedding. And that's when Lichelle Marie was like, you should shoot for Brazzers. They would love you. And I was going, look, I've never heard of them. I, I, you know, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm fine. I, I really don't want to work this trip. And, you know, a couple of days go by and I'm basically the third wheel. Danny and Eva have just got married. And there's me just walking out, you know, with them every every meal they're going to, I'm there. And it was, you know, I was thinking, okay, yeah, I'm getting in the way a little bit here. So um, a guy from Brazil at the time called Blake hit me up and said, look, we'll fly you out, we'll shoot you, um, you know, come out. I was like, okay. So I flew to Vegas to shoot and it was Vic Legina who was the, the... Whose name I still can't get over. Yeah, it, it is a cracking, <laughs> cracking name. Um, so no, he said, look, come out, shoot. So I showed up. And I remember my first ever Brazzers scene was with a lady called Misty Vonage. Um, old school. She was a MILF back then. So she's a, a coffin dodgy now, I'm sure. But <laughs> the, um, so I remember Vic's giving me the script and it was a Doctor's Adventures script and I'd broke my leg apparently and she wheeled me in, gave me, you know, the old bed bath and then, you know, one thing leads to another. And he's gone, I, I, I kind of need you to stay in character. And I've gone, okay. So in my head, like I said, I go into that focus mode. So I'm like, okay, right. I've broke my leg. Obviously, if I've broke my leg, can't put pressure on my leg. So she's giving me the bed bath, you know, we progress to the sex so i've done the whole scene on one leg with crutches <laughs> not caught we've done the whole scene no cuts and you know i fucked the pop and and that was it and he went wow that was amazing he goes why didn't you put your leg down though i went well, you, you told me to stay in character and I, I broke my leg so i can't put it down can he goes no you could have put it down i was like Oh, great thanks so and that was it and um he was like can you come back tomorrow and I was like yeah sure no problem um and that I just came back the next day and ended up shooting for them um and then they went oh can you stay another week and I was like I couldn't because I had to fly to I was flying to St Petersburg Russia to film for Rocco out there and then once I'd landed in London, they'd offered me a contract to come out. And, and that was that. Um, so I came back out, started my contract, and I never looked back, really. You know, I, there was a time when I think there was a few of the guys, we all got offered contracts. Well, I got an offered a contract to leave Brazzers. Um, you're going back oh, 10, 11 years ago, I'd say. Um, and it was at the time when Reality Kings, they were the big boys. Uh, you know, there was Naughty America, Reality Kings, and Brazzers were on the up, but Reality Kings were the, the big guys at the time. And they offered myself, Manuel, Jordan Ash, Ramon, and Voodoo contracts to go and join Reality Kings. All, the, all these other guys decided to take the contract I was the only one that, you know, I was like, look, Brazzers have gave me my opportunity. I, I'm not going to fuck them over. So thanks, but but no thanks. And that was that. Um, so, you know, I pledged my loyalty really to Brazzers then. And I was like, 
well, have I made the right decision? Because my contract's up in a month and nobody's offered me a new one yet. So I'm thinking, oh, I've made a mistake here. And then um, my contract comes to an end. And then Frank Lapari, the guy who was in charge at Brazzers at the time, said, look, here's a new contract. And that was that, really. And yeah, I've been with Brazzers now. I'm, I'm coming up to my 14th year with them. It's funny about the story about Brazzers and Reality Kings, too, because now they're both owned by yeah, the same owned by company. The same, yeah. But now I'm, yeah, direct and for <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about his penis, which is like my favorite topic, Whoa. and <laughs> how he got insured for a million dollars. So hang on. We'll be right back. Summer is here and Manscaped is here to help you level up your full body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it is guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts. And if you want to use it on your chest hair, it actually has different settings so you can get the perfect length, whether or not you're the kind of guy who likes to be a little bearish or maybe actually wants a bare chest, literally. You can get all of this inside the perfect package where well, you will find the crop preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer, as well as the crop reviver, a testy toner that is designed to give you a pep in your step. If you subscribe to the perfect package, you will get a blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered to your door every three months. So what are you waiting for? Make this your best and most hairless summer ever. Go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, we're back. So Kieran, you uh, have the only penis that I know that's insured for a million dollars. Can you tell us how that came about? Back in the day, Brazzers had uh, a really, really good PR guy called uh, Nelson. And for some reason, I think at the time, I think David Beckham had just insured his right foot. Um, I think J-Lo had insured Insured her her butt. Tom Jones had done his vocal cords or something like that. And so Nelson was like, well, look, I'm just going to put this out there and we're going to contact Lloyds of London and we're going to ensure your dick. And I've gone, yeah, sure, just let me know what I have to do. And so he got all the paperwork done. I had to go for a medical. Uh, they had to examine it, um, which was a little weird. And and that was it. It was really easy. It was you know, it was super cheap to do, I think, for them. And all of a sudden, that went crazy. It went viral. Um, I was on, I did the Chelsea Lately show. Um, I did the Jerry Springer show. How was that? That was interesting because obviously they pulled me in because 
they've insured my penis for a million dollars. But then the next thing, you know, when I've got there, it's completely changed. And all of a sudden they've got some fabricated story that there's a fangirl and she (laughs) wants to sleep with me off camera. And it was just a little weird. And then, you know, I was a little nervous because obviously I grew up and I used to watch Jerry Springer. And Does then, someone burst in the door? They're like, "I'm your real father," yeah, or "You're much. my father." Yeah, and and but the, I can still remember. I don't really get nervous, and I can still remember being in the the green room, and all I can hear outside is Jerry, Jerry, and I'm thinking, "Okay, I, I'm really sweating now. I've got massive sweat patches under my arm." <laughs> and oh no! And then I've got I walked out, and it was funny because a lot of the audience were just like college kids, and that was yeah. it. And, you, obviously, a lot of guys recognize, oh, bro, I've seen you're the guy with your penis insured for a million. And so, yeah, that was interesting. And and then from that as well, Nelly did, I think I was the, I think I'm the only male performer that I know that had, they did a billboard on Sunset Boulevard. Um, just a, a, they call me Mr. Big. And that was that. And it was just a picture of me and Brazzers, you know, the logo. And it was during some music festival. It was on the Whiskey A Go Go. So, yeah. So, the, back in the day, the PR team was brilliant. Yeah. I want to pepper in a question here from one of my Patreon members about your penis. Uh, this is from Corey Valdez. And she says, What is one paying premiums for a million dollar penis policy? And what exactly is being insured? Is the member being insured or its function or both? Just the member. So apparently I'm I'm not covered for loss. So if we, you, someone cuts your dick off, then... Yeah, I'm not... No, I, I'd be covered for that, but if I... For oh, if your reason, penis stops working. Yeah, no, if I lose my penis, then I'm not covered. <laughs> so okay. it's like, uh, okay, I, I can accept that. It's like, I don't plan on losing it anytime soon. Like, obviously my wife, she's starting to cut it off many a time. Um, <laughs> But then she would have to go back to work. So, yeah, that, I know that would never happen. So I'm kind of looking. <laughs> Wait, I'm confused. So hold on. If you lose your pe- – like literally if you lose your penis, if your penis gets amputated, that's not covered. But if it stops working like you have ED problems, that's covered? No, that that's not covered. It's just basically if – I think what the coverage was, if I break it, on set, for example. Oh, okay. <clears throat> if, I break, if I snap it, like, look, it, it happens. There's a, yeah. there's a few guys in the industry that I know that have had this happen to. And I've had a few close experiences as well. Um, it's know, usually like reverse cowgirl, right? Yeah, reverse cowgirl or, or if you go in quite hard in a certain position, you pop out and then push back in. It, you know, I've bruised it completely and yeah, it's not pretty and it's quite painful. Yeah. I, I can't even imagine. What is it that snaps? Is it like the ligament that keeps well, your penis hard? People don't realize there's actually like a small bone inside your penis. So that can, that can break, but yeah, it's the ligaments and everything like that, that can really cause damage. And that's it. You build up a, you can build up scar tissue apparently Mm -hmm. and then once you do that then you're kind of screwed like I think from what I understand as well a lot of guys that um inject the yeah they build up a lot of scar tissue yeah that's why you know they'll get to a point where even the the cabbage jack and that that they use you know they they can't use it anymore yeah the scar tissue and if you guys are interested in learning more about that, if you go and listen to my interview with Phoenix Marie, she treats people with that kind of scar tissue buildup. So she does a really good detailed explanation of how that happens and how Caverjack contributes to that and how she um, does a treatment for it. So just if you want to get more detail about that, it's pretty interesting, I think. So I know this is something, I actually hate this when people ask me this question because I always, I can never remember when I'm put on the spot, but I'm going to ask you this question anyways. Do you have any like crazy onset experiences that you really stuck out in your mind that you could tell us about? Um, yeah, I'd say there's been a, there's been a few. Um, I remember working with Alexa Thomas. 
I think it was. Yeah, I, right? she's from Spain, right? Yeah, beautiful, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful looking girl. girl. I was like, okay, so we're doing the, the comedy part of it. And I was shooting at Kelly Holland's house. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you, well, you might notice, but the windows are really, really thin. Like the glass. I, I know what you're talking about. I've seen this video, but go on. Yeah. And so we're there meant to be ten, and I've literally just put my hand on the on the window and the whole thing is just shattered, the whole window. And <clears throat> I've looked down and I've I've still to this day I've still got it. My whole hand was cut open, sliced open. And I'm thinking, oh no. And I'm thinking, I, I can't the bleeding won't stop or anything like that. So but all in my head, I'm thinking, gosh, she's really beautiful. I think she's going back to Spain next week, so I don't know if I'm going to work with her. So I've just literally said to Mark Nicholson at the time, right, get me the first aid kit. I've bandaged my hand up <laughs> and carried on with the scene. Um, I, somehow I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, and it was just in my head. But, yeah, um, there's a few – and then obviously there's a few scenes. Um, I broke my jaw playing soccer and – I was in intensive care for like nearly five days with it. And then I came out and I was probably home for like a week and I get really bored. I, I'm not one, per, I can't sit still. I like to be working. And, and it was at the time when I just started directing as well. And I had a load of scenes lined up. Um, I remember it was Alexis Ford, for example, she was doing her first ever boy girl scene um there was ah, i can't remember uh, chloe amore and another uh, girl and but i had my mouth wired shut so i you know i couldn't talk and it's probably bliss it was probably the best time to ever have me on set um but you know the office were great they were like look take as long as you want you know don't there's no need to come back you know stressing to come back but I wanted to shoot, and so I just had the guys in the office rewrite scripts, and they had scripts where I was a dental patient. They had scripts where I was in the in the emergency room. They had another script where I was a mime and things like that. So I just went straight back to work. But the only problem a is, mime. yeah, the only problem is, is you know, I I like I use spit to, to you know to get yeah, but I couldn't spit. And so I'm literally going to the girl, go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, putting my hand there so she could spit on my hand so I, I could jerk off. So, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was interesting. They were some interesting things. How did your crew manage that? Because I just feel like they would be taking full advantage because oh, you can't talk back to them. Yeah, they were loving it. And I'd just give the eye roll. They knew, like, for me, I'm good with my, you know, this was, yeah, no, I'd had Botox as well, so it was hard to even give like, <laughs> really bad, uh, give, like distinctive, dirty looks. But they kind of knew. I kind of change it up. I start, if I'm annoyed, I start going really fast, and like so they they would know. But to be fair, they were fine with it. They were they were loving it that they couldn't hear me and didn't have to listen to me. So it was great. <laughs> I think the girl, that was probably the, these are the girl's favorite scenes with me. Yeah, he didn't say a word all the time and he had this magical penis. So they got the best of both, didn't they? Did you like bring like a chalkboard and write things? Like, how did you give people direction? I was, thankfully, the scripts are quite self explanatory anyway, but it was just like map. I, I would have my notes beforehand for the scene. So I would give them to my camera guy and then say, hey, look. Just, you know, mm-mm-mm. and then he would, you know, tell them what I wanted. And then I'd be like, mm-mm, mm-mm. and then if he'd say something, I'd be like, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. And just like that again. But I could, I could kind of get certain kind of words like, like yeah, no, 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 no. That's, that's as much as I can. That's as oh much as I can. Oh, my God. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, it was, they were loving it. One other, uh, there's so many things about you that are incredibly iconic, Kieran, but I have to say the one, the, God damn it, my shirt popped open again. Sorry. No, I didn't know. Oh, I can't keep my boobs in. <laughs> this is terrible. It's not bad viewing. Fuck. Okay. Stay, stay. Anyways, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
the so everybody who's been in the adult industry for a while and who's worked for you knows that when suddenly on a performer's timeline on Twitter, <laughs> it says, I've shit myself. Yeah. We know they are working with you. Pretty much anywhere, really. It's not even on set anymore. If I see the opportunity to go for it, I'm going for it. But it has backfired for me once, only once. I know who you're and talking the- about. <laughs> and. To be fair, and like I look back at it now, and it was a long, long time ago, and you know, I am apologetic for it. Um, but it was just a red rag to a bull. It was the in the make of I don't get how these girls fall for, and I've just gone, well, okay. And then the phone was there, and I thought, well, I've got to do it. And uh, yeah, the consequences afterwards were. A right tongue lashing, shall we say? <laughs> you just can't help yourself. Oh no, not at all. And like even even like now in my personal life, it's like if I know that I'm winding my missus up, I will keep pushing it till she snaps. I don't know why. It's just just how I've been. I'm an aggravating son. Do you see that in your children as oh, well? Oh yeah. My my eldest is carbon copy. He oh. is the carbon copy. He is literally mini me Uh, so do you encourage it or do you try to discipline him no i encourage it oh you're terrible kate Kate is the one she she disciplines him for me i just i just have a laugh i joke with him and he he is cheeky but i he's just his mannerisms everything are the same as me it's like for me if i go to a to a grocery store or where look it's just the english in me i'll always say oh hi hello beautiful how are you you know it's just how you know i talk and, and things we'll go to the store now and they'll be like oh hi beautiful <laughs> and uh, you know you've got and he's a good looking kid yeah. and um you know you've got this five-year-old oh hello beautiful how are you and oh thank you and you know he's he's got a bit of a twang of the english accent as well so yeah yeah he, yeah, he's a little ladies' man as well. He's got that at school. He's like, Dad, I've got three girlfriends at the minute. I'm like, good job, good job. Oh, my God, that's adorable. Now, since you've become a father, has that changed your perspective on the adult industry or your career in general? Yeah, yeah it's made me grow up a lot. Um, before I was, no, I wouldn't say careless with money and things like that because I've never been – one that's crazy going out, spending on flash, super, things like that. But I think more so now, it kind of makes you go, right, okay, I want to plan for the future for my children. And, you know, so that's when, well, I've had, we've had Max now six, yeah, six, coming up six. But, you know, for the last seven, eight years, it's been like, okay, right, we need bricks and mortar. So we've bought, you know, property and done investments and things like that. And all of the children, they have their own savings account that, you know, I put into every month and, and things like that. So little things like that really kind of give you a bit of a wake up call. And, um, the industry itself, not so much because I, I'm very good at separating my work and my personal life. Um, I don't really, I I knock around with a few people in the industry, not a lot. Um, but majority of my friends are all back home and, you know, they're all builders, electricians, you know, they're, you know, bog standard jobs, you know, but that, that kind of always kept me grounded. So I've always had that side. So, you know, we've actually just been speaking about it in the last, you know, few days. Um, you know, we want to move back to the UK. Well, I do. Um, She's not so keen. She doesn't like the weather and she's not a fan of the food. But for me, I just think it's a it's a better way of living for the mm-hmm. children to have, you know, close friends and family. And that's what I grew up with. So I want them to have the same kind of upbringing that I did. Yeah, you're, that kind of mirrors very similarly to how I was raised. You know, my parents very much separated the industry from <clears throat> family and they always took a lot of time for family and uh, you know, so I feel like I was raised with a very healthy balance. Mm. Do you ever, are you worried about the time that you're going to have to tell your kids what you do for a living? Do you plan on having like a sit down chat? Cause people always ask me, when did you find out what your parents did for a living? And I don't remember there ever being like, 
this moment where they had to be like, okay, you know, sit me down. I think it was just this understanding that mom and dad made movies for grownups. Yeah. And that's kind of what it was. And then I don't know, I don't remember finding out, but it was never, it was never a big deal for me because my parents didn't make it a big deal, you know? So yeah, I think that's the way that we'll go back. Like, look at the moment already, I get recognized quite a lot when I'm Mm. out. Um, Especially when, when I go back to the UK, for example, I'll I'll go to the, to a football match and you know, there'll be 30,000 people there. And I probably stop maybe 50, 60 odd times for pictures throughout, you know, at the ground with, you know, people. And a lot of the time now I take my little boy and he's like, dad, why, why does he want your picture? Why is he? And I, and I, you know, he's too young to understand at the moment, but I just go, oh, daddy does some TV type work. And that's how I kind of pass it off at the moment. But I know it'll get to the stage where, you know, he'll be able to Google things. He'll be able to, you know, find things out and you know kids are so smart these days he's going to put my my real name into you know google search engine it's going to pull up everything yeah so, yeah that's the difference i didn't have internet when i was growing up as a kid yeah so and look he's a little whiz kid now on youtube and things like that so look he's gonna he's gonna find these things out i've just got to be honest with him look th- this is what daddy's done to to basically set you up for a good life you've never wanted. You've always had nice clothes. You've had food on the table, holidays and, and things like that. And so, you know, and we've, we've always taught them, you know, right from wrong. And look, there's, there's a lot worse careers out there. I could could be a drug dealer. I could be a bank robber, things like that. Look, I'm doing something that gives other people pleasure. Um, I'm not hurting anybody in the process and I'm providing a good living for my children. So for me, I, I don't see a problem with that. Um, do I hide it from other parents? Yeah, I definitely. So over here in America, I do. Not so much in the UK because, like I said, in the, in the UK, everybody kind of knows what I do anyway. You know, I'm in the media a lot and, and things like that. But over here, like our, our children go to like private school and there's doctors and celebrities that go to the school and it's like you kind of I just don't say anything like even like the the area that we live like you know we're all new neighbors oh hi what do you do and things like that and I just say I work in the internet just because I don't want any kind of discrimination against my children look my children are are honest as the day come that they're you know they 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 didn't choose my career I chose it but I don't want them being <clears throat> cast to one side because, oh, look, his dad does porn. Oh, you, you're not going around there, you know, and things like that. And people have a real bad perception of the porn industry, no matter what. Even today, um, I think a lot of people still think, oh, it's CD. It's, you know, girls that have daddy issues, people taking advantage and, and things like that. And look, I'm not going to lie. There is instances where people do take advantage and there is girls that come into the industry with um issues um but then again it's also helped a lot of girls escape from them issues and Mm. you know they've gone on to lead you know fantastic life and you know make a lot of money and great investments and you know they're happily married now with children and settled down it's you know it's it's one of them really yeah, no, I, I agree. And I understand exactly how you feel. Uh, my parents, same thing. We just kind of didn't tell people what they did for And I remember like, even when I was in elementary school and I knew what they did for a living, but I couldn't really tell other people what they did for a living. We had this kind of cover story that my mom was a glamour photographer and she had done some mainstream stir- stuff. So I'd always reference that. I remember in particular coming home with a school project and it was, uh, tell, write about what your mom does for a living. And I just remember like having this kind of look on my face in class and the teacher saying to me reassuringly, it's okay. Even if your mom works, you know, from home, even if your mom's a housewife, she still has a job. So just talk about what she does every day to take care of your family. And I was like, that's not the problem. And I had to bring it home and my dad had to help me write it out, you know, and come up and like, talk about what she did for a living, but not really. So, and I remember once a kid, uh, somehow the word got out, I don't know. And a kid brought a penthouse magazine in where she had shot it. 
and he's passing it around, telling everyone that it's my mom. And people got confused that it was my mom in the Sutterfold, not the one who shot it. And the principal found it. And then they called me in and they called my, my mom in. And my mom said to him, she goes, oh, well, it's about time you guys had some decent reading material. <laughs> so the English wit. The English yeah, wit. <laughs> exactly. You get away with a lot. But, um, I mean, we all turned out great. You know, my my brother and my sister, my sister's a nurse, my brother's a lawyer. Yeah. So, you know, they they I followed in my mom's footsteps, but they went on, you know, the straight and narrow. And I have such an incredibly close family, and I've been so fortunate to grow up with amazing parents. And I know so many people whose parents have legitimate jobs that are doctors or nurses or whatever, and they had miserable childhoods Mm. and they have a horrible family structure and their parents don't talk to each other and they fight all the time. So this whole idea that people who work in porn can't be responsible and loving parents, I think is so absurd. And, you know, I just, I, I love talking to people like you about that because I think it's so important to dispel that. Yeah, it, it is. Like I said, for me, I separate. There's Kieran that's on set, but it's completely different, you know. Yep. When we're at home, it's, you know, okay, have you brushed your teeth? Have you done this? Yeah. That's how it is, you know. You just kind of go back to the values that you were taught growing up. And that's what, you know, me and my wife try and implement into the children today. And it's like... Listen, like my little boy gets absolutely scolded. If he if he doesn't use his P's and Q's and his manners, then, you know, it's, you know, I see a lot of people now with, you know, we're around people that have children, you know, they, they might be movie producers, doctors, and their kids are little shits. You know, mm-hmm. they've got no man, they, you know, they just take, 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 want, 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 scream and kick off. And we've been really blessed that our children aren't like that, but that's, you know, majority of it's down to Kate, um, mm-hmm. the, how she's brought the kids up. She's amazing, amazing, amazing mom. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, I love this topic specifically now because I'm actually, so my big project, which is going to have to be in 2021 because of the baby that's coming, but I'm, I'm going to shoot a sizzle reel in the next couple months, is doing a documentary on my mom. So I've been pulling all these this archival footage from interviews that she did back right before I was born in the late seventies when she published her book. And there's this one interview in particular that was so interesting to me. So she went on a current affair in Australia Mm -hmm. and the journalist, you know, and it's so it's interesting watching her do these, these interviews in the late seventies where misogyny just ran, run rampant. And, you know, people definitely weren't as open about sex work as they are today. And this journalist is asking her, and this is literally like a year before I was born. So she conceived me a couple of months after this interview and I'm the oldest. And he says to her, you know, do you have children? She goes, no, but you know, I would like children. And he just says in this really accusatory tone, what kind of mother are you going to be when you grow up? You know, considering what you do for a living, how are you going to raise your children? What kind of morals are you going to teach them? And she was kind of taken aback by it. And she was just like, well, what do you mean? I think I'd be a great mother. You know, I'm going to teach my children compassion and respect. And she's like, what else do you teach your children? And it was just this, this incredible moment where this guy's basically telling her, you're going to be a terrible mother because of the line of work that you do. And then I'm born almost, you know, like I said, like a year later and I had a wonderful childhood. She's a wonderful mother. And it's so, it's so interesting to watch that back as a grown adult now and just see how incredibly off base this journalist was just basing these assumptions on the stigma that people have against the adult industry. It is crazy. Like, look, you've got so many other professions that, you know, they, they, they have children and then they don't care about their Mm -hmm. children. They, they're just still fully focused on their careers and kind of put the children to one side. And then next thing, you know, kids have gone off the rails, they're doing drugs, they're doing this and whatever. It's look, a lot of movie stars, for example, Mm -hmm. in the mainstream world, how many times do we see, you know, mainstream movie people that people look up to and go, wow, he's fantastic. What a great actress. And then they have children and next thing you know, you, you're reading the news. Oh, they've just been found with possession of this. They've just been drink driving and, and things like that. It's, look, I don't care what industry you're in. As long as you 
you know, teach the basics to your kids and, and teach them, like you said, compassion and how to treat other people well, you'll be yeah. fine. Yeah. What is the one thing about the adult industry you would change if you could? Um, this one might not go down well. Um, I would say more equal pay for male performers mm. in the biz. Because, again, I know, obviously, a lot, a lot of guys now make great money. Um, but then you've also got, you know, some guys that are really established that do fantastic work. But, you know, they're, they're ending, they're making a lot less than some of the girls. And, look, I always look at it this way. I remember Christoph Clark used to say to me on set years ago, the guy is always king on set. And I agree to that to a certain extent. Um, I think both uh, should be equal on set. Um, mm-hmm. Because look, without the girl, there's no scene. But without the guy, there's also no scene. If you've got a guy that can't get his dick hard and that everybody gets frustrated, and and there's no scene that takes place and and you know you've probably been in that situation before where you've had to basically call the day because you know the guy can't can't perform mm-hmm. um so i would like to see you know maybe a bit more equal but then again you have to look at it look people are joining to see the girl so um, that's there's only that kind of slight thing that i would like um I think recently with everything that's gone off in the industry as well, um, you know, hopefully now we're going to have a bit more of change. Like I, I, I've never, ever agreed with the whole IR thing. I think again, that's an American thing because it Europe, is an American, it is an American thing. Yeah. In, in Europe, you never really heard of IR. You would literally, a lot of the time when you're, you never knew who you were working with till the day of. Um, so I, I've, I've been on sets many a times when you've got there and, oh yeah, you're working with Sensei today. The biggest, friendliest black fella you've ever met. And she's never done a scene with a, a black guy before. And it was never a problem. It was like, okay, cool. Great. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I think obviously over here in America, they've glamorized it a lot. And, you know, it's kind of, it's caused that divide where it's like, oh, well, you know, and agents uh, are really guilty of it. But then you could say studios are as well. Um, yeah. By agreeing to to pay X amount more to work with a black guy. I, I, yeah. Me, it baffles me. Um, and it's been a real sensitive subject for me, like, because um, – I've had, I I had somebody, when somebody said to me the other week and they went, oh, I bet you're one of them people that say they don't see color. And for me, yeah, I, I, you could say I'm ignorant in that way, but no, I I don't see color um, because it's just the way that I was brought up. Like a lot of people don't realize that, you know, I'm part Indian myself. And so I grew up with blacks, whites, Asians, you know, you name it. So even to this day, I never look and go, oh, Immy, you know, oh, he's the, the Pakistani lad that's now, a, you know, a banker. I just go, oh, Immy, tall guy, good looking lad, great footballer. I've never, ever seen that or or Damon, oh, fat black kid. I never say that. I go, oh, he, he was the fat lad, absolutely fantastic footballer and things like that. And so for me... It, it's been a bit of a touchy subject. And when people go, oh, yeah, well, you've never experienced racism. And it's like straight away, they, people go, oh, you're white. You've never experienced it. Listen, I was I was a white kid going to an all-Catholic school, getting dropped off by a six-foot-two Indian gentleman, which was my granddad. So the the amount of racism that I had when I was growing up at school, oh, you you packy, oh, you stink of curry, oh, did you come in your taxi, oh, I bet you're in a corner shop, things like that. So, you know, I, I've experienced it myself, but, you know, like I said, within our industry, I never experienced it in Europe. And personally, I, I never saw it in Europe. It's only when I came here to America that I mm. saw the big divide. And and that's a, a big change that I would love to, to see. And hopefully, you know, we're now going in the right steps where, you know, they're just going to get rid of that and everybody's equal. 
paid in yeah. for work. And that, that would be a huge change, I think. Yeah. I had Isaiah Maxwell on a couple of episodes again ago, and he said, and it was so true. He said, you know, American porn is just reflective of American society. Yeah. And he says the racist, the systemic racism that we see in porn is reflective of the systemic racism that we see in American society. So, you know, yes, we definitely need to address the issue in the adult industry, but it's such a widespread issue that all of America has to deal with. Yeah, for sure. As it's a big way. It's like if you said that, and when we, I was talking with my wife the other day actually about, and we were saying like, in the in, if I'm talking about the UK, if in the UK, I've never really seen you know racism towards black people because obviously where I grew up, it, everybody was different color and, and nobody, yeah. you know, my my grandmother was the first white woman to marry an Indian in in the UK, and it caused huge controversy. Um, I would say more so in the UK, you have more racism towards Muslims mm. than you do blacks in in the UK. And that, yeah. because with everything that went on, you know, 9-11, and then you have a large influx of Asian people in the UK, you know, right. I've witnessed it myself. Uh, you know, I'll get on the tube in London and there'll be a row of three, four suit, seats next to a, a Muslim gentleman and because nobody wants to sit next to him, oh, it could be a terrorist. I'd, I'm not going to sit there, and and things yeah. like. That. And it, it's really sad when you when you think about it. But yeah, to, going back to the the subject, yeah, I would, that would be another big change. And like I said, fingers crossed, it, you know, it's gonna it's gonna come into place. But it should never have been there in the first place. Really, yeah. I've always stuck by the the saying, "Look, we all bleed claret." Yeah. <laughs> Simple as. <Yeah. that. laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy how it took the Black Lives Matter movement to finally bring that issue to light. Yeah. Because it's been something that's been kind of quietly disputed for a long time. Yeah. I want to actually kind of not... So the other the other issue, there were two major issues that came up in the adult industry recently, um, racism and porn, and then also... Um, you know, violation of uh, yeah. sexual abuse and porn, that kind of thing. And I know that you and I have, have have talked about this, you know, with phone calls that we've had with MindGeek and their attempt to really like have a strict code of conduct and make sure that these things don't happen on their sets. Um, so I want to kind of relate that to an interesting question that one of my Patreon members asked about men. So Jabberwock said, with all that is going on about consent boundaries and safety for the female performers, have there ever been cases where male performers felt uncomfortable? I mean, being a male porn performer has got to be one of the manliest man jobs there is, and men are usually just told to suck it up. Yeah, it's actually a point that I actually, I think we I brought up in one of our Zoom meetings. Yeah. The amount of times that I've seen, you know, where they might, the guy might be asked to have sex on something uncomfortable. Yeah. Again, that's, that's the same for the girl as well, but you know, the guy is having to perform so it can, you know, if you, if you can't get the right movement and things like that, you're gonna, you're gonna struggle. But the big thing that I've seen is like, Hey, look, the girl might not be hygienic down below. And it's just like tap on the back. Come on then get on with it. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. What is you know, it's quite off-putting. It's you know, it's affecting my my performance. It's like, yeah, well, we only need twenty-five minutes. Come on, let's, let's get on with it. And that's one thing I've never, you know, I, I'm not really a fan of. It's like for me, I'm quite outspoken as it is. So if you know, if a guy comes to me with that issue, then I'll say, hey, sweetheart, do you mind just having a quick rinse uh, mm -hmm. and things like that? And look, it's an awkward, you know conversation oh, yeah. to have yeah but sometimes it needs to be done because look and it's the same like i try and always make a point of it anyway like look i've had guys that have shown up and they've just literally rocked in and they're there they're you know they've had a cigarette and they're having a sandwich and oh, okay yeah, i'm ready for textiles no you're not well no i am i'm ready no go jump in the shower wash your bollocks and brush your teeth do you know what I mean? And, and it should be the same level footing for, for both. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, I've seen a lot of guys that, you know, have been put in situations. I, I've been put, I got put in a real awkward situation. You're going 
14 years ago, I went to uh, Russia to film. And I can still remember basically walking into this room and it was maybe about, you know, 12, 15 girls. And we just basically had to pick who we wanted to work with. And um, I don't know, it just didn't sit right. And I was, I was talking afterwards and basically a lot of these girls were like, you know, they were just basically being pimped out. And it didn't sit right with me. And, and I still remember to this day, I refused to do the scene just because I was like, nah, look, this isn't right to me. I, For me, I, I grew up, I, I was brought up by my mother, my, my grandmother, and obviously I had my, my little sister. So for me, you should always show a woman respect, you know, very old school in that sense. But like I said, it didn't sit right. And, you know, I... I didn't bother doing the scene, and I remember I didn't I didn't work for that company ever again. You know they they portrayed me as a problem child. Oh no, he doesn't. But like I said, sometimes you know if a guy if it doesn't feel right, don't do it and as yeah. a guy. And you know, yeah, you're going to get repercussions. I'm sure you're going to lose out work. But at the end of the day, it, it, for me, I, I feel better having a clear conscience of not forcing a girl into doing something she didn't want to do. Yeah. Yeah. You don't ever want to walk away from set with that disgusting feeling that you no. made somebody do something they didn't want to do. Yeah. It's a horrible feeling. Yeah, it is. It is. It is hard. Like I've, I've done scenes before, like in Europe and you can tell the girl really doesn't want to be there. Um, yeah. you know, it, it just sits uneasy with you. You know what I mean? Like granted she might've been in for a few times, but you know, it's clearly a job for her that a job that maybe she's not enjoying. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it just doesn't sit right. And so, yeah, like I, I'll always say, like, look, is there anything like the guy, if you're not comfortable with, or, like even things like I've seen girls that are super aggressive performers and you can see the look of fear in the guy's face. Like, look, if she goes crazy, he ends up breaking his dick. It's him that's going to lose out money. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. it, hey, look, like, hey, I know you're working with a girl that's quite extreme today. At any point you feel uncomfortable, just shut cut. No problem. Mm. We'll cut, we'll reset and, and things like that. Because I don't want a guy going into a scene thinking, oh, wow, I'm working for Kieran today. I've got to pull out all the stops to do a great scene, but then ends up injuring himself or doing something that he doesn't want to do. So I always say, look, just let me know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I wish that had been like the case for me during, you know, some of my scenes. Like I've had to do scenes where I'm like, this is crazy. Like, what am I even doing here? You know, in the middle of the the desert, shooting a scene, and like with a, one bottle of water, and you're thinking, this is this is just nuts. But mm -hmm. yeah, and it's like you just wish you could say no sometimes as a guy, but you do get you know portrayed as that problem child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like kind of in the same way that women are portrayed as being difficult, you know. And now with the Me Too movement. We're giving women their voice and we're letting them talk about their experiences and we're trying to be more sensitive to that. But I think we also need to remember that men are people too. And just because, you know, society has taught you guys to always suck it up and be a man and never complain, you know, one should consider you as well. I mean, everybody should have proper respect and treatment on set. I think that just makes for a better experience for everybody. Yeah, for sure. And like I said, I can, I can see you know, why it's daunting for females on set. Because look, at the mm. time, nine times out of 10, in, in apart from your case, normally it's only the makeup artist that is the female on set. Mm. Apart from that, it's a very male-dominated, uh, you know, cast and crew and things like that. So I can see why it can be daunting for for a female. But then on the other hand, it can then have the opposite effect for the male performer. You know, it's a very male dominated set, but hey, I've got to be macho and I've got to basically bang my chest in front of all these other males to prove that I'm the man. Look, I'm the one getting naked and having sex with this girl. I've got to just get on with it and, and beat my chest and, and be that alpha male. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I've learned now that, look, don't like it. I'm not doing it. Simple as. And, yeah. you know, I, I've, I've, I love my nickname of princess or diva. I love it. You know, I, I wear the crown with pride. 
<laughs> do you still uh i know that you always shower before each scene i've i sadly i have only god how many have i ever shot you in a scene i feel like maybe once, once or twice or something I for, can't remember I don't who remember. the girl was. Um, I don't remember either. Was it Aria Alexander? You, I think you were supposed to be in that Quest movie, and then you couldn't for some reason. Yeah, I was meant to be in the Quest movie, but not. Let me tell you something. You dodged a fucking bullet. That movie yeah. was a nightmare to I, make. I remember that. I, no, I remember we did one scene. It was like a Gonzo scene. I think it was with Aria. Oh, you're right. You're right. It was at that one house that the next day the owners, oh, God. That, yeah, that you had a nightmare it. with the house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the, the following day, thank God the day you were there, it was fine. But it was beautiful. Yes, yes, yes. That one. Beautiful house. But yeah, no. To end I always have a shower before. So I'm a. Don't I'm a, you offer the girl a choice of cologne too? Yeah, correct. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I've never seen that before. It's it's one of them. I always say like which because look, I could put on a cologne that I don't know a, a dad wears that you know could give a you know uh, that's yeah cologne my dad wears or you know listen she could have had an abusive boyfriend that used to wear that cologne and it could set off bad memories and things like that so. Or, or, you know, she just might not like any of them. And yeah. like, why why put someone through something that they, they don't want to like? So I'd always say, hey, look, here's a choice of three, four clones. Which which one would you like to wear? And, you know, it just adds to, like, the chemistry for your scene of, you know. I think it's that little, like, detail, that extra little, like, I care about how you feel makes the girl feel good, too. I think psychologically it's a good move. Yeah, and it's like, and also just, like, having a shower, like, hey, look, I'm going to have a shower. Like I've been in scenes like I used to drive Brett Brando up the wall because he would be like in the middle of shooting and then he'd be like, right, okay, we're going to go straight from this into the blowjob. And I'm going, nah. What do you mean? No. No, I, I need to. We might be in the middle of the desert, but I'm still going to have a bit of a rinse. What do you mean? And I'd literally have bottles of water, but a mini bottle of Dove, and a towel and just rinse the undercarriage out so everything smelled nice and fresh. Because look, it's for me again, it's really important in the performing side of things because if I don't feel fresh, clean, and hygienic, I'm then thinking in my head, I'm not focused on the scene, I'm not focused on the girl. All I'm thinking is, does she think I smell? It's like yeah. that's it. And so it sways me, and that's all I'll think about. And I won't think about the scene. So for me, it's it's super important just as in, as you know as a pleasantry towards the girl it's important to me so i'm i'm in a focused head straight you know right right no that makes sense okay i have two more questions from you from patreon members and it's about soccer or as you would say football, football. swearing at me calling it soccer I heard you say soccer earlier yeah like, i know and then i just thought oh why have i said that so then i went back to football. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the first question is from Dave W. He says, I know you're a big soccer in parentheses football fan. If you could change one thing about the game, what would it be? Would you change the offside rule? No, I like the offside rule. I love the offside rule. Um, at the minute, I would kind of maybe change VAR. I just think there are certain things with VAR that are letting it down and it's slowing the game down. And like, you know, some of the decisions, they're really crazy. And so, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of VAR at the moment, but yeah, that's probably the only thing. All this shit's Greek to me, but I'm going to yeah. ask anyways. Uh, 10 foot board says you have to ask about Derby countries or county. Sorry. Hey, uh, Derby, Derby, Derby counties, Derby. <laughs> Derby. I should know this should know considering this. all of the fights that you used to have with my ex-husband about football. I did. To be honest, I'll, I'll tell you this. I actually texted him the other day and I just sent him a barrage of abuse because. <laughs> Was Nottingham Forest playing oh, Derby? Oh, they fucked it up good and truly. And I, I you know, I, they, were, they were in the playoffs. All they needed was one point and to get in the playoffs, even a, they didn't need a point. The other team had to score four and I hope Nottingham Forest didn't concede four. Nottingham conceded four and the other team scored four and they got knocked out of the playoffs. And I was, take that, you red dog scum. I, well, 
<laughs> and that's probably some of the more pleasant texts that I sent. And then, um, yeah, I remember you used to drive him crazy with yeah. that. I haven't. We're actually on good. We're on good terms now, um, but we don't talk. But I heard he had a baby. I, like I, six I, months. I, ago. I don't know anything like that. All all my text conversations with him is you red, dog, you red dog scum. Fuck off, you forest wanker. Pretty much that's it. I've got I've got a real pattern of hatred towards forest fans. Last question. Uh, Ten foot board says you have to ask about Derby County's future with Wayne Rooney. I think he, since he's coming in January, he's done fantastic. I noticed in the last I don't know five games he was kind of blowing out of steam a little bit, but he's great role model for all the youngsters that we are coming through. He's a, he's a brilliant footballer, and you know he's still got the footballing brain. You'll never lose that. And he's been a massive influence on the likes of Max Bird, Jason Knight, Louis Sibley that are coming through. So yeah, he's, it's a positive one. That's you know, I, hopefully he's there next season, and you know we can push on for the uh, playoffs and promotion. You haven't got a clue what we're talking about, do you? Nope, <laughs> not at all. I'm just not in my head. Like, sounds great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not in agree. <laughs> Kieran, thank you so much. This was uh, such a pleasure. Um, I really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. And uh, this was a lot of fun. It was actually. It was very. You sound surprised. Yeah. um, To be honest, I hardly ever do podcasts because I normally always put my foot in it. Because, like I said, I'm very outspoken. And sometimes I'll just say the the wrong thing that will wind people up. So I just go, you know what? Sometimes it's just better not to say anything and keep yeah. my opinions to myself. But, you know, this was quite an easy one. Yeah, I try I try to be diplomatic because believe me, there's every day I wake up waiting f- to be canceled over something that I said on my podcast. And yeah. I've, certainly, I've certainly said things that have come, God damn it, sorry. Yeah. Have, my boobs popped out again. Oh, have, have come back to bite me in the ass. So yeah. That's like me with like Twitter and things like that. Sometimes... I'll see things going off on Twitter and like, I just want to go. And then I just think delete. It's not worth yeah. it. Yeah. You know absolutely. I, mean? like, I think, I think you realize that as you get older, cause you're never going to win like a Twitter argument and it's just not going to get you anywhere. So just, yeah, just exactly. let it go. And it's like, sometimes like you want to defend people as well. And yeah, like, then it's going to come back on you and, and then, or pe- the way that people are, they perceive you in a, a certain light after that. And yeah. Like, you know what? I'm quite content with the missus and the kids and, you know, we'll go to the beach today and, and that's it. I'll just turn my phone off and, and that's it now. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. No, I agree. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Well, obviously browsers, that's, you'll see an abundance. If you go back in the archives, you can see the young, good looking Kieran. And if you look at the the recent ones, you see the dinosaur Kieran with new hair. Um, silver, silver, silver fox. fox. Silver fox. Silver yeah, fox. yeah, yeah. George Clooney of porn. Um, it's pretty, I say George Clooney. A lot of people just say Yoda now. But, yeah. <laughs> but it's like Yoda with Botox. Um, <laughs> no, uh, that. And obviously my Browsers Plus uh, profile, which has just gone live recently, which is Browsers Plus forward slash Kieran Lee, I think. Yeah. Uh, I should know that. And obviously my Twitter and my Instagram, which is Sir Kieran Lee. Fantastic. Oh, which I am actually doing in England. I'm buying a plot of land so I can can become a lord. Are you really? Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. So I'll be Lord Kieran Lee. Oh, God. We'll never hear the end of it. (laughs) Yeah. It'd be good, huh? They they wouldn't (laughs) let me change it to Duchess. (laughs) (laughs) and you guys can find me at holly randall on twitter and on instagram if you want to support this podcast go to patreon.com slash holly randall unfiltered thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next week manscaped is here to up your body grooming game Their lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that will not only not nick or snag your nuts, but can also be used on your chest hair. If you get it in the perfect package 3.0, it will come with a bunch of liquid formulas to keep you feeling and smelling fresh 
all day. And for a limited time, you can also get a free travel bag and anti-chafing boxer briefs that come with it. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping.